Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gwen Hunt. I'm from Tripwire. Tripwire is a company based in Portland. We do enterprise solutions for security, namely things like file integrity monitoring, database integrity, um, vulnerability assessments, dynamic threat analysis. We don't do antivirus, that kind of thing. That's not, that's not our job. Um, we've been around about 16 years and about 500 people. So who am, who am I? Well, I've been uh, cranking software for quite a bit of time, uh, C++ since 1994. Um, currently, the last four years, I've been with uh, Tripwire as a tech lead for new solutions for new generation security applications. Previously, I was with iMove, a perpetual startup. Have you ever been in that world? It's a lot of fun. You don't get paid that much. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get paid at all, but you do cool things like in one day, reverse engineer a, a um, firewire driver and then terminate fiber in the afternoon. It's, but anyway, I did that for 10 years. And then IBM, C++, and Java, and I will admit it, I coded COBOL a long time ago with EDS. But I saw the light, I read my first KNR book, and I've been in, in that direction since. So why do we care about security? Almost every day we hear about another data breach. And these are some of the big ones recently in, in North America. Target, Home Depot, JP Morgan, Apple, Google, White House, and OPM. Now I start two of these because I'm directly affected by these two breaches that I know of. There's maybe another one. Home Depot uh, bought some paint supplies quite some time ago. And when I was back east last February, because skiing here was horrible, I was in Vermont, Someone was using an exact replica of my card, which I had in my pocket, in Brooklyn, checking parking meters and making charges. And uh, according to my bank, uh, they suspect that it came from the Home Depot um, data breach. The last one, if you've ever filled out an SF-86, that's just for a, a security clearance with the federal government, since 2000, it's all electronic, and there was over 21 million records that were leaked. We think a nation state, to be named, uh, did this. And so uh, things like they just also released yesterday that over 5 million people had their fingerprints. So somebody somewhere has got my fingerprints and got my whole history, everything about my brothers and sisters, my mom and dad, cats, dogs, everything I knew. So anyway. Some statistics, these are overlapping categories, but from the Online Trust uh, Alliance, 89% of all these data breaches were considered preventable. They can identify a single event or a single couple of events that if they were properly taken care of, the breach probably wouldn't have happened. 31% are due to inside threats. That doesn't mean disgruntled employees. It could be an employee leaves a cell phone that has the last pass master password in it and has all the corporate passwords at a bar somewhere. So it's you know dumb things like that. Weak or stolen credentials, um, social engineering, just little things like, oh, I forgot my elevator pass, can I write up with you? And then somebody gets on and sees an open terminal, gathers enough information that's, that's used for another attack down the road and eventually ends up becoming a data breach. 37% in 2014 were analyzed to be direct attacks. That people were going specifically for a particular bank or a particular government uh, facility. And then lost or stolen devices. 2013, a couple other of these organizations said 823 million personal records were exposed. You can imagine what it, what it was in the last couple of years. Okay, gotta be smarter than the clicker. Okay, types of threats, obviously crime, organized crime. There are big syndicates, especially in Eastern Europe, that like to steal money from us, steal money from everybody. State-sponsored, uh, insiders, script kiddies, people, they, they, you know, they read about a script on the internet and they get on and they, they run a war script trying to break, get into any particular box they can find. Breaches often start small, 
weak or stolen credentials or lost or stolen devices can start a cascade of events. Um, small compromises eventually leading to a data breach, but sometimes they, they happen really quick. The target breach, according to Krebs on Security in September 2015, once in the network, attackers had full access to all store POSs and the whole, all of target. No partitioning whatsoever in their network. The initial breach was compromised VPN credentials for an HVAC firm. Uh, interesting point too, the black POS malware that was found on all the car readers in um, Target, an updated version was found in Home Depot and it was altered a little bit to made to look like a part of the antivirus package that was on the Home Depot um, systems. So what are we going to talk about? Well, we're not going to try to solve the big macro problem. We're going to focus a little bit on what developers can directly access, and specifically in our world, in the C++ world. <clears throat> and I'm going to go through a little bit about, um, talk about some references that are out there, some books and a website, talk about some integer vulnerabilities. I'm not going to get into strings or uh, arrays. Um, there are, we just don't have the time for that but uh, there are great sources for that. Talk a little bit about a programmer's toolbox, um, some processes, and then I'm gonna go into a, a detailed scenario of a, applying some, some security rules. Okay, three books that I highly recommend. This first one, Secure Coding. Yeah, it's a little bit old, but what I really like about this, it doesn't try to be a cookbook, like you see this, follow this solution. What it does, it sets up kind of the, the, the total holistic view of how to approach security. That security is not something you just bolt on to an application, throw a couple of flags in release mode, and it passes that and send it out the door. No, you, you need to start from the very beginning, uh, what the application is supposed to do, and figure out what things you can do to protect it. I like this book a lot. This book, it, I saw it's for sale outside. Highly recommend it, um, both in print and also in um, Kindle form. It's actually very readable in, on Kindle. This is the second revised uh, book from Robert Secord. If you want the nitty gritty detail about stack smashing and canaries and all that good stuff, go to this book. There's page after page of really good information. And this last one, it's also a little bit older, but I liked it because it, uh, John Vega talks a lot about uh, interfacing open SSL. It's an earlier version, but talking to all the different APIs. So if, if you ever have to deal with open SSL, this is one of the good places to start from. And then there's a website. This is put on by CERT. Uh, Robert Secord is uh, heavily involved with it. And we'll take a quick gander of what that site looks like. This is the SEI CERT coding standards. Um, there's a bunch for Android, C, C++, and Java. First, I want to take a look at, um, let's take a look at C++. And look at this introduction first. Talk about priority and levels. Every vulnerability or issue here is is classified using the standard of um, vulnerability, likelihood, and the remediation cost. So when we get a little farther into here, we'll take an example of C++. Declarations, initialization, we'll start right from the beginning. Goes in excruciating detail, basically um, don't use the old C stuff. Here's the, the C variable variadic interface. And it talks about the rationale, be, uh, why this is non-compliant, and then offers compliant solutions. So every category that's here that they list on the site follows the same pattern. Some are a little stale, but most of them that, I, that I've seen are real current. Um, a lot of folks are spending some really good time in this. Okay. So I'm going to start with integers. 
and homework for you all. Um, take a look at the strings and arrays, and uh, particularly in the C chord book. Let's take a look at integers. Unsigned integer app, signed integer overflow, and conversion issues. Okay, so we're gonna look at some code. Okay, this is a real simple program. I'm taking a um, unsigned 32-bit int. I'm setting it to max value for 32-bit int, incrementing it, and then I'm setting it to the min value and decrement it. And by, I'll take a look at what it does. So it's as we expect. Uh, it's good to be reminded that uh, we're at the top end of a 32-bit int. We increment it. We're going to go. We're going to wrap to zero. Okay. No surprises there. What about um, integer overflow? Signed int overflow. So this is similar, but this is with signed ints. And um, we're going to go to the max value. We're going to increment, and then go to the min value and decrement. No surprises here, right? We got, we're at the, the high end of the 32, but we're gonna wrap all the way to the, the negative value. Let's take a look at conversions issues. We got a couple conversions here. I've got a 32-bit int. I got um, unsigned int. I'm assigning the value of 32-bit at max value to a, 30, to a signed 32-bit int. We expect some loss of data there. And I'm going from an unsigned 32-bit uh, int to an uh, um, unsigned 16-bit int. Let's go see what that looks like. Okay, so you, you can imagine that if you're not doing any kind of range checking and you're doing converting back and forth from signed to unsigned, you can easily get into problems. And I'm gonna have a, a simple little application I'm just gonna call a bad, app, bad application. And this guy's purpose is got a little worker class and in it it's got a work thread. And this guy all it does is consume a, a large buffer and sleeps, but you can equate this to a worker thread. And then based on argument input, we're using program options um, we set the thread count and we're off and running. The default is three on this, so. And so, okay, so I'm running the three threads. I'm gonna switch to a VM because I don't wanna crash my Mac. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna run this with 400 threads. Take a look at this screen right here, this memory utilization. Well, I basically DOS my box. It's because I've got unbounded, I'm not checking at all on the inputs. And why did I bring out this scenario? This is actually a fairly common scenario. You can imagine that um, you've got a package of applications, maybe you've got a little daemon that sits on a UDP socket, does some utility, but nobody's really touched it in five years, but it's always distributed with the new software. Somebody gets on a new box, systems administrator touches the file system, all of a sudden it's world readable. Somebody gets on the box, they, they're, at least they have an account, they're looking for ways to compromise it. And so they're gonna look for, let's go to opt, and see if we can find an application. Copy it over into a temp directory, play with the command interface and see what they get. And, and well, they got gold here, they can shut the box down whenever they want, all in user space without having root access. So a way to mitigate this a little bit, I've got a better app. 
this is pretty comp complex, um, but uh, I surgically removed a bunch of code from stuff I wrote four years ago with the, the equivalent of using a weed whacker. But it's, it, what this says is give strong type safety to arguments. And so I have this properties class that I add a 32-bit int property. I give it a, uh, this is what the actual argument is online, a default value and a description. And I set a range on it. So right off the bat, I'm setting the maximum it could, between one and three. And so when I try to run this application, and I'll, I'll run this on a Mac every day of the week. Okay, uh, default to three, then let's say I uh, do a, and we get an exception right off the bat. So the behavior of this, it just throws an exception. Um, we typically, uh, what we do is log that there is an out of range and then we use a default because our systems have to come up. But this is, this is also a decent behavior, maybe that you just log it and exit. And if we go the other way, we go to zero, we get the same thing, we're out of range. It didn't take a lot to add this capability. And we'll take one more look at the code for it. It's all based on a bunch of templates, but they have this thing called a basic property. The basic property has a name, description, default value, a value, and a string value. And it has some, um, some setters and some getters and the ability to set range. And then subclass that, and I have a numeric property here, a template for that. And you can imagine you could do one for strings, you could do one for boost file pass, you could do it for time durations. There's all kinds of different properties, but you can follow the same pattern. Okay. I want to show you one more thing. Um, Robert Ramey, if you folks have met him, he has introduced a library into the Boost Incubator called um, um, Safe Numerics. And I like it a lot. I haven't used it much, but I think it's got some good application. And here's, if you just Google uh, Boost Library Incubator, then look for Safe Numerics, you'll find this. And um, the problem is that often, as I showed earlier, mathematical operations uh, don't do what you think they're going to do. And, um, and he builds a case for it. And then his mechanism is a set of header-only templates that introduce this idea of a safe integer, for example. And if you try to set this integer outside or use a a different value outside the range, an exception gets thrown immediately. People ask, what does this have to do with business and that sort of thing? I, I would say that almost any system you can think of, of value, flight control systems, um, ABS brake control systems in a car, anything to do with money, the ranges, they're very important. And so you'd want range checking and this kind of facility could be very helpful. Robert Secord, in his book, goes into, uh, gives you a couple of nice tables of all the different conditions and operators that can cause wrapping of an unsigned integer. And you can see there are a lot of, a lot of these operators. Maybe you don't think it's going to happen, but there's a good chance it will. And then with signed integer overflow. And he also has a similar chart for uh, truncation. So when you go buy the book outside there, you can thumb through these. Excuse me. Um, Conversions, generally always safe to go from small unsigned ints to large unsigned ints, but potentially not safe, and the programmer has to step in for these other cases, particularly when truncation is a possibility. Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about Programmer's Toolbox. Um, first thing I like using is multiple compilers. This is the set of compilers I use because compilers, even different versions of the same compiler, give you different um, warnings and um, errors. So I routinely always code on GCC 4.8 and, cl and Clang Xcode first and then go to the others. I have a lot of code that runs on Windows XP embedded, so I'm still stuck to Visual Studio 2010, but I will be moving to 2015 as soon as I can get that running because it has a tool chain that allows cross-compile to XP targets. But a lot of value in like, if you're not quite sure in one compiler, run it, bring it up in another compiler. Intel compilers are also very good. They're not as compliant with C++ 11 or 14 as the others, but they get in there quickly. The thing about the Intuit tools, they've got a wonderful profiler called VTune Amplifier, if you, if you haven't used it. I think it's one of the most user-friendly out there. <clears throat> other, other things, put this in your toolbox. These are a list of flags that, are, that will get you um, discover warnings and problems that, that you won't get when you just uh, run it in debug, maybe debug mode. All of these are GCC and Clang, except for the sanitize, that's Clang only. Uh, on Xcode, it only supports address. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'll make that change. It's good to know. Okay, this is probably very stale, but vis on Visual Studio 2010, these are the additional flags. I'm sure 2015 has some other ones. I'll update that when I'm um, able to um, bring up Visual Studio 2015. Other flags that help mitigate attacks. Um, these do things like uh, make, uh, prevent or help reduce buffer overflows on the stack. Uh, eliminate ex execution capability. Um, not all of these are visible in Clang or usable in Clang, and I identified those in blue that are GCC only. Um, also, memory relo uh, relocation or ASLR in, in, in the Windows world, PIE in the kind of GCC world, all very useful. And before I get back to code, I want to just breeze through some of this um, secure programming processes. This first one may seem like, oh, this is just another architect filling up slides, but uh, I think it's pretty important. As, as an organization that wants to build up a capability, a secure capability, you need to kind of define the framework that you work within. And we, we use principles and mechanisms. And one principle may be all internet domain sockets uh, connections have to be encrypted. And the mechanism we use TLS 1, 2, high string cipher suites, X509, um, P, um, PKIX compliant with RFC 6125 for identity verification. I'll get into more detail what, what that means. Principle, uh, we authenticate the message source. And a mechanism is we use hash, ba hash based message authentication codes across the whole message. And so we could tell if they're tampered and we know who signed it. <clears throat> principle, all applications must build with no warnings. Now, there are going to be cases where you're going to have to locally suppress a particular item, but generally, um, like one of our principles is that no warnings. Force common coding standards. I know it's going to harsh someone's mellow, but um, people that like to code any way they want, but when you, the best pattern matcher on a planet is probably the human. And the ability to see common, recognized shapes and patterns will pick up errors so quick and pick up problems so quickly. Um, but it also makes the code more readable. When you see somebody else, some other colleague, you haven't worked with them, and their code is, looks the same or is formatted the same, it helps a lot in understanding. There are a lot of good examples. Um, people point to Google C++ coding standards. We use a lot of it. Uh, we don't use the portion of it because our code is a lot newer. We use exceptions all through our code base, so we deviate from that. Plus, my company's mostly historically been a Java shop, and so we camel case everything, so we don't use underscores in our names. 
<clears throat> code review system, we use review board. That's one example. I like it better than uh, pull request. Um, it has to get a thumbs up by people on the team before we commit. Version control system, um, it's probably real simple, but if you don't have, if you're not using one, your code isn't that important. <laughs> you really need this for a team of developers, especially distributed. Um, we, we used Bazaar for a long time and it was good, but no one's doing anything with Bazaar, so we all went to Git and we got the GitHub. And for the most part, it works good, but Git can be really frustrating at times. Um, then the last thing, the fact, or one of the last things, the fact, a defect tracking system, particularly when it's integrated with the version control in your code review system, uh, it makes everything seamless. There's no, you don't lose information and uh, everybody has context to a particular problem. And, the, uh, and the automated continuous integration, these are things that uh, we, we do every night. I've got 30 some odd platforms. My main code runs, static analysis runs, automated fuzzing, daily integration tests on all target platforms, and it's a big deal if something breaks. And we've got to investigate all failures, and that includes testing failures, because they may mask some other failure. So it's, it, we treat a, testing, a test problem just as important as an application problem. Okay, penetration testing. If you're large enough, um, grow some ethical hackers, some people that can break your code. Uh, I wish I could say who are third party, but we use a lot of third party. Um, and I specifically will go in with the, the full code and I'll say, break this, I want you to break this point, I want you to bring that point. And they've been very helpful in helping us harden our code. Very, very expensive, but very worthwhile. Okay, now we're gonna get back into some more code and I got a scenario here Imagine a company that does, it's called Consolidated Services, that uh, provides web backend and web processing engines for a bunch of virtual stores. Um, these stores are all visible from the internet. You've got a bunch of customers worldwide. And then you've got fulfillment houses that um, when a product gets ordered, one of the processing engines sends a fulfillment order to the, the appropriate fulfillment house. So we're focusing on the yellow here in this, this connection. And as consolidated services, we, we want uh, our partners to do it right. We don't want them to lose information about customers. We, uh, we don't want any issues. So we're gonna help them by building a library. And this library is gonna do some message handling, parsing and serialization, and it's gonna do encryption and decryption. The security considerations um, that we're going to protect the session with TLS 1.2, we're going to authenticate the message source, and we're going to encrypt the fulfillment order. So there's this, this is security in depth and in layers. First, um, TLS 1.2, if you're not using it, you're vulnerable. If you're using 1.1, you're wrong. Using 1.0, you're wrong. SSL 3. Go dig ditches or something. <laughs> You're in the wrong job. <clears throat> uh, high string ciphers. Um, this is an example of the elliptical curve ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. And I broke down what the, the different pieces mean for the, uh, of the algorithm. But this is a relatively efficient uh, but very strong uh, cipher suite. 6125, I put this here because there's a lot of confusion and there isn't a lot of information that's easily digestible. But 6125, basically, you're using items that you strategically place in a subject alternate name of your certificate chain that help you uh, verify that uh, you're not communicating with somebody that's acting as a man in the middle in, the, in an attack. And part of that mechanism is to use service IDs, that FO server that is, uh, represents a service, message represents a protocol, and then the rest of it is a domain. And then you got the same for, for, for the client side. Um, 
also additional fields that are set in, uh, for, if you're a server, you never want client offset. You never want it um, to be set for, for, for key, for key CR, or, or CRL signing. You don't want those kind of things. It, it just needs these settings for a server and a client needs to be for a client. And if you get someone that says a server off, you should reject, reject the conversation. And the reason I put this here is because um, I don't know of a fully compliant 6125. I had to write a lot of code to do this. Uh, I use Boost ASIO and I use exits out of OpenSSL callbacks to once OpenSSL does a certificate path verification, then I iterate through all the certificates and look at these specific fields and match them up that they're compliant. Okay. Almost, almost the code again. The second thing we're doing is we're, we're using a message that we're using the HMAC code in front of it. And HMAC, or this is the message format, it's a serialized protobuf message. It has an HMAC field, it has a UID field identifying a unique message, a type, time, and then encrypted message bytes. That HMAC field is, is the, uh, across all other fields. So you can tell if anybody tampers with any component of the message. So with that stuff done in advance, we've got kind of an idea of what a structure might be, and this is a candidate structure. We're building a library. The L0 at the bottom, that's third-party stuff. We're using OpenSSL, and logically we're using a bunch of stuff from Google Protobuf. Even though it ends up in the bindings, I just put that down there that's saying we are using stuff from Google. Then I got a low-level layer, which we'll walk through some of these pieces that are open SSL, but they're not meant to be the public interface we want the third party to use. And then we have L2, which is the actual public interface we want the third party to use. So they don't have to get uh, mixed up in the, um, how am I doing for time? Half hour? Good, good. Um, we don't want them to get lost in the nitty and gritty of OpenSSL. Okay, last thing before we get the code, I'll talk a little bit about the AES, um, it's pronounced Ganwall counter method. Um, Ganwall or G-A-L-I-O-S. Um, they're a mysterious company in Portland, about 50 people. Supposed to be really smart. They have large foreheads. We <laughs> I, 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 they do a lot of work for DARPA and, and that sort of thing. But they came up with this years ago. You have certain inputs. You have a 256-bit symmetric key derived from a high-quality key derivation function. The key is never sent with the encrypted message. So this is a shared secret symmetric key. One is on the, uh, your fulfillment house has it, and then consolidated has the other. There could be mechanisms to rotate these keys, age them, and replace them, but I'm not going to get into that. The idea is the key is never sent with the message. Initialization vector, this is important because the very first block that gets in, uh, encrypted needs some reference or a random material to do that encryption. Uh, usually it's about 128 bits, but this particular algorithm, it's 96 bits. And then you got your plain text. And in our case, a plain text is a serialized fulfillment order. And then encryption outputs, cipher text, and then a 128-bit tag generated for tamper detection. And then we concatenate the tag plus the IV plus the cipher text, and that's what gets uh, put in the, um, the message block. We, uh, very important thing, we don't care if anybody sees what the IV is. We just never, ever use it more than once for that particular key. And then the outputs, um, the, well, the decryption inputs, we got the symmetric, same symmetric key, we got the IV, we got the tag, the ciphertext, and we get the plain text output. Okay, so let's look at code. So I go to Stack Overflow and I read and have a cold brew coffee and in just a few minutes I crank out 
No, I don't want to do my test. I crank out my very first wrapper around it. Uh, I've got, this is an encrypt algorithm. It's still pretty C-like. And it's got a decrypt algorithm. I'm hinting at a lot of things that are wrong. We'll go through that in a minute. But let's run a unit test. So it's going to compile the, the unit test, which is it's, it's a boost test here. Some pieces go with it. And what we've done is we've taken a, a key that I generated through an, another uh, a random uh, sequence generator function that it's based on OpenSSL. I created the IV, and then I've got a plain text, which I just generated a bunch of sequences and concatenated together. Um, then encrypt it, and then and then go through the decryption. I match the original to the to the uh, uh, decrypted, and everything is happy. So I'm done, right? I got a working algorithm. Uh, anybody hazard a guess right off the bat? Some of the things that are wrong here. Pardon me. Yes, yes, yeah. The, the comment was that the, the decrypt exits without cleanup, and that's very important, um, which points out at this particular algorithm, I'm actually doing a dynamic allocation of the context used for Cypher. Uh, this is a deprecated interface, but OpenSSL being the way it is, uh, a lot of the old interfaces are still visible. They're, they're fixing in that now, especially with version 1.1, in the future versions, they're they're letting the stuff die, die, or they're making it uh, making it disappear. But this is a deprecated interface. Also, all these functions, almost all these functions, have a return code. And with this particular C interface, you need to check the return code. And I did give a couple examples here, but where I'm returning the value, I'm not being slick. I'm being like an old C programmer. I'm returning negative numbers. Um, I'm leaking because I'm not cleaning up on this context. Okay, so even though I got a good algorithm, if for some reason my tag value is wrong or something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, lose memory. So I make another pass at it. Still a little C-ish. Um, I'm checking return codes, but I'm also, I also got the leak problem. Okay, so this really didn't help much. Let's go through a better code. Okay, I changed from the char stars and length fields to standard vectors with unsigned chars. Um, they work really well with, with this interface. I also uh, use the new context. I have appropriate exceptions that are thrown. In the same way with the decrypt. And so let's take a look at, we'll make, make sure our algorithm is still there, uh, is still correct. Okay, no errors detected. Uh, I'm using a much larger uh, plain text field of 38K, but basically this, this test is very, is very similar to the previous one. I am going to, now, since I'm pretty close, I think I've got it where I want to, I'm gonna change, turn on the big heavy flags. Oops. In my CMake setup, I've got this debug secure target, and you notice that all my CMake, my main C++ flags, I've now turned on all the the ones that would help me find issues. So when I compile this guy again, which I'm gonna do just the application, just the algorithm. 44 errors, warnings, which I didn't get before. So I was like going from debug, turn on these flags, and going through these, uh, kind of, made, and actually the first time I did this, kind of made my heart sink, because a lot of them have to do with boost format. 
and boost format works really well. I don't think it's it unless you set type. Um, sometimes um, I have to set, create temporaries. You're going to get these constant conversion warnings. It's more important me, uh, for me to use the the flags than it is to use boost format. Okay, so I got to fix that. So let's look at level four, next version. I'll roll back up there in a second. But the so I replaced boost format with uh, just a couple of helper functions, standard stream, uh, no big surprises there. But I did introduce something here because I wasn't sure I was going to get cleaned up correctly. And so I created an RAII wrapper around the context. In this context, I'm calling save context. In the constructor, I'm knitting it and uh, for just so we could see it, that it's actually being called. Uh, context, I've got little text messages here, and then I'm doing cleanup. This is one of the rare OpenSSL functions to where a cleanup routine has a return code. A lot of them don't. Um, if this doesn't clean up, that means something really bad, and that application's gotta die. And so, in this, my simple log program, I pass it a fatal, and the application should just go away. So the way that works is I create the save contact C, and so where I use the, the reference or, or the address operator on the context, I just it's just a little bit different with C dot, whatever. But um, I don't have to worry about doing a cleanup in the end because I know when the save context goes out of scope, it's gonna get cleaned up for me. I also introduce something, I, those I pushed up into a null namespace and the actual functions that the third party will use or in a, in a public namespace, do some size checking. Because uh, and we, we want to know right off the bat if the key is incorrect or if the IV is incorrect or if the uh, plain text is zero. I mean, there's no reason to encrypt. So I added some additional checks for that. So with the high level, um, Flags on, compiled, and then it compiles clean. Well, that's the end of my code demo. <laughs> that's, the end. That's, the, that's the end. Are there any questions? <laughs> Sorry for being so abrupt. Um, And I got a lot of boost there. Yeah, because it, it, some of this uh, is harvested from a, 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 a block of C++03. Um, the question was, why am I using some... Instead of asserts? Yeah. That's uh, our pattern. That's, that, that's our preferred usage. Uh, I guess we... we there are very few exceptions we can't handle and recover from, is I guess, is our approach. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, there is some Valgrind mentions that I found some on today. Yeah, yeah. There may be certainly better places. I know that the search site is actively supported. I can repeat the question. <laughs> um, why? It's a statement that uh, you that I talked about the search site, and the search site is uh, doesn't provide some information that other sites do. Yeah, 
in particular with memory analysis. Um, I, th I think the search site is very actively maintained or appears to be now, and you could sign up and you can add to it if you want. Um, they've just moved it to Confluence. I've signed up, I haven't added anything to it yet, but you do have that capability. Yeah, it's, it seems to be getting that way. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Stack Canary? Yeah, yeah Canary. Um, we haven't overtly used it. We've turned, we're just now turning on the flags and for the compilers to create that for us. And some of those flags that, that I showed in the mitigation, we'll turn those on. Uh, we don't do anything overtly in the, in the code for it. Black hat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what? What are the question was? What are um, what are some good resources or tools for people that are interested in becoming ethical ha hackers? And black hat. We have people that go there and speak and and win competitions and it's supposed to be a lot of fun. I haven't got there because I'm I'm enslaved writing code. Yes, it is. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. We, in our automated stuff, we actually have a, a, a our, our automated continuous integration is a Ruby RSpec framework uh, that, that works with our artif artifactory and our repository and pulls out all the different pieces and tests it. And um, there are some fuzzing engines with Ruby that we use to inject into our C++ code. Uh, we haven't spun up, I spun up LibFuzz um, when I was at C++ now in May and that looked really cool. I was able to replicate the finding the heart bleed bug in minutes. Um, that's on our path. It just Since our other fuzzer works really well, we haven't introduced it yet. Any other questions? You have two minutes. Well, I don't have anything else to add, so <laughs> thank you for coming. I hope this was useful. <laughs> um.